Amen. Well, good morning, Hivey Church. It's good to see everyone this morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. Turn with me to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. And while you're turning, let me welcome all of our guests who are here today. Such an honor to worship with you. Welcome. Uh, as Pastor Tyler already mentioned, please consider filling out one of those Connect cards in the seat in front of you. We'd love to get to know you better. And our text for today is Colossians 3, verse 16. We will spend the vast majority of our time in this one verse as we unpack it. Colossians 3, verse 16. I'm going to read this and we're going to pray. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. And what we are not, kindly make us for your son's sake. Amen. Tough love. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term. It's kind of an out-of-date concept, not particularly in vogue in our current, softer, more coddled culture. But growing up, I heard it a lot. Now, Now, let me say, at the outset, some forms of tough love are actually not love at all. Some forms of tough love Um, if I can just be candid, can be abusive and destructive, and then called tough love. But the idea behind tough love was to demonstrate that you had someone's best interest at heart by doing the harder thing. Usually that involved doing something or saying something that that particular individual that you are attempting to love may not like, but will ultimately be for their benefit. It is a tool you must have in your tool belt if you're ever going to really love somebody well. Uh, For example, I, I think it's kind of impossible to be a halfway decent parent and not do this from time to time. You will have to risk being disliked to be truly loving at times. You will have to risk being disliked to be truly loving from time to time. No one demonstrates this better than Jesus. No one. We see this all throughout the Gospels, and it is this kind of love for one another that our text is calling us to here today. Today we're continuing our summer series, One Another, Life Together in the Local Church, and today's message we've entitled, Disciple One Another, and we're going to break this up into two parts, really simple. Part one, discipled by Christ. Part two, discipling one another. So part one, discipled by Christ. Part two, discipling one another. Now let me go ahead and concede there is no one another verse in your New Testament that explicitly says disciple one another. But as we were planning out this series and looking at the 59 one another statements in the New Testament, we kept coming back to a common theme of discipling that is present in several of the one another statements. So today is a bit of a, of a header sermon over a series of other one another's that all kind of get lumped into a category, if you will. We're calling disciple one another. Just some examples of this kind of disciple one another emphasis in your New Testament. Hebrews 3.13 says, here's an example, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today. That means every day, uh, until you die Exhort one another. That's a word we don't use a lot. 
But the idea is to encourage and admonish and kind of push someone on to Christ's likeness there. Why? That none of you may be hard. He's talking to the church. He's talking to a local church. So that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. It's almost like we don't always know what's best for us. And we need other people to speak into that. That's exactly what is being communicated by the writer of Hebrews. And then, of course, Romans 15, verse 14, the Apostle Paul, who we're going to read from today, says in verse 14, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and here's what he's really excited about, able to instruct one another. So in Hebrews 3, we see this call to exhort. In Romans 15, Paul says, I'm really happy you guys can instruct one another, teach one another. Exhorting, admonishing, teaching, discipling. They go hand in hand. And then, of course, our text today, Colossians 3.16, is on teaching and admonishing one another, specifically. But this passage also tells us what we must have, what we must possess, before we ever get to the business of discipling one another. And that leads us to part one, discipled by Christ. Look with me at Colossians 3.16 again. And I want to draw your attention to the first section of that verse. The first section, verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So before we ever get to the teaching and admonishing stuff, which we'll get to in just a few moments, I want us to bear down, press into, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Notice the command to teach and admonish comes with a prerequisite. There is something we must possess in order to disciple one another. So here at the outset, let me put uh, my cards on the table. If you miss this, you kind of miss the whole sermon. Our ability to disciple one another is directly connected to our personal relationship with Christ through his word. Our ability to disciple one another is directly connected to our personal relationship with Christ through his word. All discipleship starts with Christ. That's who we're making disciples of. And here in the book of Colossians, the apostle Paul's aim is to keep our focus on him as we make disciples. Paul writes this to the church in Colossae. The city was located in modern-day Turkey in the Lycus Valley. And, and being so far east, it had a lot of different influences affecting the church and its culture, even religious practices. It was heavily influenced as a church by Jewish thought, Greek thought, and also oriental mystic religion that was prevalent in the region. In Colossians 2, Paul tells us that these conflicting views, these, these additions to the gospel, are muddying the doctrinal waters of the church. They are keeping people from focusing on Christ. The Jews were insisting on adding ceremonial laws and dietary restrictions to the gospel. The Greek and Oriental factions insisted on adding the worship of angels and other secret attainment knowledge that you could acquire in addition to the gospel. So Paul spends this letter trying to clear the water that's gotten really murky in Colossae. And he tries to refocus everyone on what matters, and what matters is Christ. Oh, how easy it is to miss that. And that's exactly what he's doing here in our passage today. In Colossians 3, verse 11, Paul drops what amounts to an atomic bomb on all of this superficial division. He says this in verse 11. Here, that is inside the church, here, 
There is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave free, but listen to this, but Christ is all and in all. That's a remarkable statement. That's a remarkable statement. And what a timely verse for us, Highview Church. Think about this for a moment. Colossae was struggling for unity, and they did not even have social media. No cable news networks. The term gaslighting did not exist yet, okay? And here we are 2,000 years later, and Christians are still being divided in an infinite number of ways by an infinite number of things. The end result, we lose our focus on Christ, being all and being in all. That's the thing. Competing identities, seeking to pull us into this tribe or that tribe or whatever it might be, always narrowing, always seeming to find ourselves with less people around us that disagree with us on anything. That's how, one way you can know you've been sucked into an echo chamber and that's where you're living your life. Everyone already agrees with you. But it's amazing that a, a, a people, a time, in a, in a time where we are in echo chambers is an angry, violent people, still. Maybe not from those in here, but those out there. The cultural climate we find ourselves is very similar to the one Colossae found itself, very similar. And the remedy the Apostle Paul prescribed then is the same remedy now. Christ is all and in all. Christ is all. Think about that for a moment. Christ is all. Do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? Okay. Do you believe it's true, inerrant, infallible? Then think about the implications of that being true. Christ being all. What does that even mean? Here's what Paul is saying. The things that would divide us are completely and totally dwarfed by the Christ that unites us. That's what he means by all. He, he means a place of preeminence. It is what we all have in common in this room this morning. It's Christ. We all believe that Christ is all. Now what does that mean? Look at Colossians 1.18. One of my favorite verses in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, he writes this, that he, that's Christ, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. So, so here's what Paul is communicating. Everything exists to show that Christ is better. Same concept as Christ is all and in all. That Christ is above and beyond all things. Like that's God's vision for the church. A people from every tribe and every nation, different socioeconomic backgrounds, experiences, so on and so forth, but it is a people who while on the surface have so little in common, they are brought together by the shared confession, Christ is all. And this same Christ who is all, the same Christ who supersedes the universe itself, in his glory is the same Christ who dwells in us, in us all, by faith. That's the battle cry of the disciple-making church. Christ is all, Christ in all. It's a remarkable statement. Church, Christ must be all or he will be nothing to you. We have people in this body who grew up in lots of different denominational backgrounds and traditions. Lots of different opinions on lots of different things. But what brings us together is the same thing that will hold us together. And it is this. We confess Christ is all. 
we confess the one Lord Jesus, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. And as we confess that, we stand in line with an endless line of billions of brothers and sisters that have lived for 2,000 years. We join our, we take our place, if you will, among that family that transcends time itself. If we ever let go, have you, of our confessional identity, if we ever attempt to find our unity, our ultimate identity in lesser things, if we ever replace the Christ of the New Testament with another all, we will lose everything. God will write Ichabod over the doors of this place. And honestly, I don't care if anybody comes back because I won't be here either. Christ must be all. Christ is all. Christ in all. That's our solitary focus. That's our commitment. All discipleship starts there. Before we disciple one another, we must be disciples of that Christ. But what does it mean to have the word of Christ here in Colossians 3.16 dwelling in us richly? We talked about the Christ, but what does it mean to have the word of Christ to dwell in us richly? Well, first we need to know what that word of Christ is. It's an interesting word choice by the Apostle Paul. It reads literally, Logos Christos. The word of Christ. That, that's what it says. So when you see Word of Christ, literally it says Word of Christ. Now the Word of Christ is the Holy Scriptures. And Paul could have just said, of course, let the Scriptures dwell in you richly. But he chose to teach us something here about the connection between Jesus and the Word. And it's very similar to what we read in John 1, 1 that opening, almost Genesis-esque beginning to John's Gospel when he writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, we all know that's Jesus, right? That's Jesus. Jesus is, of course, the Word made flesh. So here's the takeaway. Here's the takeaway. This is so important. You cannot know the person of Christ without knowing the Word of Christ. You cannot know the person of Christ, without knowing the word of Christ. They are synonymous. If you miss one, you miss the other, and so on. Don't miss this. I'll say it again. Our ability to disciple one another is directly connected to our personal relationship with Christ through his word. The Apostle Paul says that the word of Christ must Dwell in us richly. That word we translate as dwell. It's the Greek word, enokeo. It, it simply means to take up residence, but it's got a lot of nuance to it. The word can also mean to take up residence with authority. To, to, to move in and be the boss. To move in and call the shots. Some of you have relatives, when they, when they stay, they, this is what they do. They, they take up residence and they are suddenly in charge. This isn't just used to, to describe a guest is what I'm getting at. One who's just staying in your home. It, it's actually like having a new owner. Like you're not in charge anymore. Give me the keys. Hand them over. And that's what the Word of Christ does when it dwells in us. It starts taking over. That's why it's one way you can know if the Word of Christ is dwelling in you. Do you feel like you're not as in control as Christ is of your life? Here's how one commentator put it. The idea is not a temporary visit, but a continuing abiding presence. That's what it means for the Word of Christ to dwell in us richly. I love how one of the reformers put it. Paul does not simply say, let it be heard, but let it dwell. <laughs> the word must permeate our entire being, influencing our thoughts, actions, and desires. Paul does not say, let it be heard, like just hear the word of Christ. 
He says, let it dwell. Let it dwell. Church, I'm not talking about advanced Christianity here. This is Christianity 101. If Christ's word does not dwell in us richly, we can't disciple anyone effectively. It's that simple. This principle is not really hard to get. Like we're in the middle of vacation season, middle of the summer. Uh, We go somewhere, we do not live, we stay there for a few days, we leave, we come home. And at some point in the future, maybe we go back. But we do not dwell there. Now let me ask you a question. Does the word dwell in you or stop by a couple times a year? Are you tracking with me here? Does the word of Christ have kind of like an Airbnb condo timeshare type situation in your heart? Or does it live there? Does it dwell in power there? Or is Christ at best an occasional house guest that very easily wears out his welcome and needs to move along? So how do we get there? Like how do we get to a place where the word of Christ dwells in us? And then there's that, that modifier, richly. It means, it means abundantly. Well, there's only one way, and I'll go ahead and tell you it's hard. It's hard. The only way the Word of Christ will dwell in us richly is through a long-term commitment to Bible intake. I, I, I don't have a quick solution for you. No, pray these three things, do these five things, checklist for you. You're just going to have to grind life out with the Word of Christ. And those minor deposits you make every morning, every evening, on your lunch break, wherever it is, add up to an invaluable source of spiritual wealth. But there's no way to micromanage or kind of manipulate your way into that state of spiritual wealth. You're just going to have to day in, day out, take in the word of Christ. You know those people that when you you hear them pray, it's like you're just hearing scripture? That's from just dwelling with the word of Christ for a very long time. People that Spurgeon said, when you cut them, they bleed Bible. Bible. How do you get there? You microwave that? You, 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 do a, you do a special class on that? It's not how it works. We make daily deposits from the treasury of God's word into our hearts and we reap the eternal value of it. That's the only way. As I was thinking about this passage, I had one of those light bulb moments, which are <laughs> dangerous for me sometimes, but most of the really godly people that I have known in my life had Bibles that looked like they were falling apart. Pages written all up, every cover in there coming apart. There's like a map of Palestine hanging out of the back of it. You know what I'm talking about? The maps, all the maps. Are we all going to like treasure trove? Like, like are we looking for treasure with all these maps? What are we doing with the maps in this thing? It's a whole other discussion. Get a good study Bible. End of rant, okay? But every single really godly person I know, man, they got a Bible that's just, it's just beat up. And I came across a Spurgeon quote, and I couldn't help but add it. It was so good. It was capturing this so well. It says, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone that isn't. That's why these sweet little grannies, man, they're, they're, they're just ascending to new levels of godliness all the time with that beat-up Bible. That, that KJV they got is just standing the test of time. Don't hate on them for reading their KJV. You don't read your ESV. <laughs> but they've just been, you know why they don't replace Bibles? Because for 80 years they've been grinding it out with that Bible. Leave them alone. They've been grinding it out with Scripture, man, day in and day out. 
And man, they are spiritually wealthy beyond your wildest dreams. A Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to somebody that's not. Now, I didn't say people who read their Bible regularly do not go through difficulties and trials. That's not what I said either. It means that when they inevitably do go through those trials, they are sustained by a food that this world knows not of. So they don't fall apart. That's the idea. Now, we do know this. There is a direct connection between spiritual health and Bible intake. And we know that's not just anecdotal. Certainly it's biblical. We see it in the scriptures. Call to read our scripture, to feast on God's word. But we also know this from just data, taking in data, observational data, recorded data. As a matter of fact, one survey of professing Christians from a couple years ago showed that people thriving spiritually were regularly doing two things. Two things. They were going to church and they were reading their Bibles. Eureka, right? It's crazy how that works. People who were struggling spiritually, interestingly enough, scored really low in both of those two metrics. Pastorally, almost everyone I talk to who's on the rope spiritually is investing very little time in the Bible. I mean, it's almost across the board. And once that drops off, you'll usually see a, a, a regularity with the gathering dropping off as well. They almost always go together. That's also interesting. Church, um, I think that we need to fast and feast around here this summer a little bit. Um, we need to spend some time away from things like social media, and we need to invest some extra time in the Word. How have you? Summer would be a great time to get serious about Bible intake. Fast from podcast and political content for a week. Start there. Replace podcast or music in the car with an audio Bible on your drive times. Do it for a week. Just start there. Actually, just start with a day. See if you can do a day. No podcast, political, junk jargon, whatever going into your brain. Just Holy Scripture on your drive time. See what that does. Um, here's one. Fast from social media for a week, and while you're doing so, start a Bible reading plan with two other people from the church. This is really simple stuff. You have to do the intentional work of hiding the word of Christ in your heart, church. You have to do the intentional work of that. What does this have to do with discipling one another, though? It's really this simple. You cannot pour out what you are not taking in. You can't. Have you noticed how much more edifying it is to spend time with someone who's in the Word than somebody that's not? Let's just be, let's, can we just be that blunt about it? Have you, have you noticed, like, someone who knows the Word and they're committed to the Word, and, man, they're in the Word, versus somebody that's, that's not? Just how much more edifying and encouraging and maybe even convicting and correcting that time is. It's incalculable, the difference. You cannot pour out what you have not taken in. What is discipleship? It's a pouring out of the word of Christ for disciples of Christ. And if you're not taking that in, how can you pour that out? It'll come off as just kind of fake, weak, now, we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at what it means to pour out. So we're going to move from discipled by Christ to discipling one another. Like, we've talked about the intake portion of this. What's it look like on the poured out side? Well, look again with me at Colossians 3.16. The Apostle Paul, he doesn't leave us in the dark here. He starts with, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. There's your prerequisite. Here's the command, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom want to work through this particular section of the verse as we finish our time out. First teaching, the dasko in the Greek. It just means to instruct. Now, the first thing we notice about this is that this verse, and I want you to catch this, this verse for teaching and admonishing one another, it's not designed for only pastors, nor even other teachers in the church, those who maybe teach classes or have some type of teaching role. 
nor those who feel like they have the gift of teaching. This is a blanket, church-wide, one-another statement, teaching and admonishing one another. It's for the entire church, not addressed to pastors specifically, nor elders, nor deacons. Now, does this mean that every member of this church should be able to stand up here and teach on Sunday mornings? Of course not. Does it mean that every member needs to be able to lead a gospel community group or Bible study? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. What it means is that every Christian should be able to help another Christian understand what the Bible says. So that's what I'm talking about. And we can do this only if we have the word of Christ dwelling in us richly. Like, how how am I going to get to a place where I can pour out into people? Again, have the word of Christ poured into you. That's what you're offering people. What do you think you're offering? Your wisdom? Like, your wisdom? If it's valuable, it'll be the wisdom from above. (laughs) No, we're, we're offering them Christ. So what you have to offer them is the same thing I'm offering them. The word of Christ. Don't miss that. The entire community of God's people has always had a responsibility to disciple one another through teaching each other God's word. Now, of course, this starts at home. The pattern established with God's people in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 6, starting in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. It's a great commandment. You guys are familiar with that. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Listen to verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. You seen the lifestyle of teaching and instructing happening here? And when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. So basically your entire life. We're all teachers. We're all teachers. Children remember more than you know, that's for sure. My daughter and my three-year-old were coming to church this morning and um, just quiet car ride. She's in the back. And uh, she goes, Daddy, Jesus loves us. I said, yeah, he does. Praise the Lord. He sure does. How do you know that? And she said, because he died for our germs. (laughs) It's like, okay, so we're getting, we're not quite there. And there's been a lot of sickness in my household, so I'm going to excuse that for that purpose. And then I start thinking, well, I mean, you know, when you start thinking about new heaven, new earth eschatology, I mean, there's going to be no germs in that place as well. No sickness, no death. Hey, listen, it's worth taking the time to teach another disciple the word of Christ. It's worth it. It's worth it. The teaching of God's word amongst God's people, it's always been a community project. And that's the point I'm trying to make. God's people have always discipled each other this way. And our mission at Highview is really simple. Make disciples. And when we say make disciples, we're also saying teach teachers. A disciple is both a student and a teacher. Don't take my word for it. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, it's the Great Commission you've been around church at all, you know it. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, Jesus, how are we going to do that? Verse 20, teaching them. You can't make disciples apart from teaching. It's impossible. You can't make disciples the way Christ is telling us to make disciples at least. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, and he promises his presence. I'll be with you to the end of the age. Christian, can you explain the gospel to someone who asks you what it is? Can you correct blatant heresy when you hear it? Are you able to defend your faith when someone attacks it? Are you able to provide a reasonable response when someone asks you why you believe Jesus is the Christ? And is it biblical when you respond? Can you open your Bible and help someone understand what they are reading? Why is it so important that the people of God in the local church are able to teach one another? I'll tell you why. Because for 2,000 years, the greatest protector and preserver of the gospel has been local churches. 
that someone got up and taught heresy. Someone got up in the fourth century in a pulpit and taught Arianism, and then they said, no, 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 that's not right. Sit down. That's heresy. You know the only way you have a people who can do that is if they have the word of Christ dwelling in them richly. If you are a believer this morning, you are a protector and a defender of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. And in order to do that well, you're going to have to have the word of Christ dwell in you richly. This is why. Because we need the self-correcting community that is the local church that fights off almost like some type of, of, of white blood cells fighting off false doctrine and teaching. We must teach one another, and then we must also admonish one another. I expect fewer amens here. Admonish, nuthateo. It's a word that rarely gets used in our culture. I mean, when's the last time you came home from work and told your spouse, I was admonished by my boss today? Never, probably. Like, that guy's a jerk. Something like that. But it wasn't admonished. I was admonished. Because it may, even saying it, it makes you feel like you're five. I was admonished today. What? Jeez. Now, new theteo, it means to warn or caution. Literally, the words mean, listen to this, to put sense into someone's mind. That's a literal translation, which is kind of a hilarious way to describe discipleship. Putting sense into someone's mind. Another more literal translation would be to correct one's path when they stray. So based on that definition, my wife admonishes me every time I'm driving and she's in the passenger seat. She's correcting the way that I go. It, listen, if teaching means instructing, okay, then admonishing means correcting. And there's way more tension that comes with correcting than teaching always. That's harder. Admonishing is difficult. Again, this has always been a feature of life among the covenant people of God. Like right in the middle of a long list of instructions on how to live with one another, we read this all the way back in the Old Testament book of Leviticus. Leviticus 19, verse 17. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. Listen to this. But you shall reason frankly with your neighbor. It's interesting stuff. Lest you incur sin because of him. We translate that reason frankly. In other words, you're to tell them the truth. Even if it's a truth they don't want to hear. So that you do not hate your brother. That it's actually hateful to let someone live in a lie. He says... Do not hate your brother in this really polite, non-confrontational way, therefore sin against them. Let me put this in the most simplest terms possible. If we're going to love one another, we're going to have to be willing to have difficult conversations from time to time. I've been on the giving and receiving end of countless in my 11 plus years planting this church. And I'm thankful for all of them. I'm thankful for what God did in those moments. One verse that helps us understand admonishing well, it would be Ephesians 4.15, very familiar passage, where Paul encourages us to speak the truth in love. You heard that before? Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. In other words, if there's going to be spiritual growth, there's going to be someone willing to speak the truth in love. That out of a love for this individual, I'm going to tell them the truth. Listen, love is a necessity for admonishment. You should be really slow to admonish Christians you do not love. You should be slow to admonish Christians you do not love. But then you should ask yourself, why do I not love a fellow Christian if Christ is all and in all? Like, can I at least love the Christ that is in them? Admonishment is always far more effective within the context of relationship. That's the point. Some people intentionally surround themselves with people who would never admonish them in a million years, and their level of spiritual maturity shows it. Not only do we need love to do this well, we need wisdom. 
And that's where the, the verse ends. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. Here's the modifier, in all wisdom. In all wisdom governs the teaching and admonishing. As a general rule, if you're low on wisdom, be slow on admonishing. Herman Bavink, another great theologian of yesteryear, he wrote that wisdom comes from the Spirit, and this ensures that our words build up and do not tear down. That's why wisdom is a necessity. I don't know about you, but new Christian me could have used a high dose of love and wisdom after I came to faith in Christ. I had a high dose of zeal for the truth back in the day and a very low dose of love and wisdom. And I have admonished people in the past, okay, years ago, that held positions then, and I admonished them and tried to correct them, that hold, held positions then that I now hold today. That's the thing about time. This thing about dwelling in the scriptures richly over years and years and years. Christ starts correcting you too. What does it look like to teach and admonish? In all wisdom, well, do not admonish others with personal opinions, whatever you do. And do not admonish others with personal preferences. Admonish from the Scripture. Brothers and sisters, if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, this is your calling. This isn't just for pastors or elders. This is your calling. This is the one another for all of us, just like the rest of them. And it seems fitting that the Apostle Paul ends the verse with an example of how this gets expressed in the local church. He says, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I want you to miss this. Worship is where it all ends. It's also where it all begins. Serious question, when you worship, is there thankfulness to God pouring out of you as you consider the word of Christ and its value dwelling in you richly? Is there joy? Is there thankfulness? Or are you just kind of waiting for the singing to be over every week? And now you're like, actually, I'm just waiting for the sermon to be over. Okay. But is there a thankfulness and a joy as you sing psalms straight from Scripture and hymns, songs of praise, and spiritual songs, these songs with gospel themes? Is there, is there something coming out of you that Christ and his word dwelling richly in you has put in you? I'm a bit of a history buff. I was recently reading a lot of World War II history. Got on one of those kicks. And I came across a story of one truly horrifying battle was fought where this group of Allied soldiers, they're pinned down behind enemy lines. And they survived for days and days in these trenches that were called by the men just hell on earth. And the soldiers were growing desperate. At one point, they were thinking the end is near. We're going to die in these trenches. They were waiting for reinforcement to arrive, but it was still several days out. And then one particular moment where it seemed like the end was upon them, a soldier started singing a hymn. And within a few moments, these terrible trenches of warfare, in the middle of this terrible, terrible battlefield scene, became a place of worship as the trenches were filled with singing and praising. And one soldier said as he was in that trench covered in mud, thinking he was about to die, when he heard those hymns, he thought, there is hope at last. Here's what we're doing, church, when we sing. We are singing in the trenches, waiting for a final deliverer to come, our great king and warrior, the Lord Jesus. And as we sing, and as I hear your voices sing, it gives me hope. You see, that's what we're doing. One way we teach each other, we sing to one another. We sing these hymns of praise. So sing, and keep singing. Sing to disciple one another. Sing because the king will be here shortly. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this unbelievably rich verse that 
Lord, if I preached it 10 times, I couldn't unpack everything that's there. But Lord, I pray for the people that are under the sound of my voice in this moment that have gathered. Lord, I pray that Christ, the Christ who is all, would be in all. And so for those in this room who maybe they've never repented of their sins and trusted in Christ, I pray that they would cry out to him by faith, you would save them. By a work, Holy Spirit, only you can do. Would you do that now? Lord, we ask all this in Christ's name.